Greetings, mankind. I see you have crash landed your intergalactic navigator. You are in luck, I would say, having landed by chance on our planet. My medics are already on standby, ready to provide any necessary help for you and your crew. Don't worry, even though we ourselves are not human, believe me, we are truly knowledgeable in the human anatomy. Unfortunately, previous scans done by my machinery experts, which were conducted while you were unconscious, assure me that your ship is beyond repair. Surely your entirely male crew must be scared, confused as to where you are. Even for such burly, able and ambitious men, I can see the glint of fear in your eyes, which your space goggles fail to truly hide. The sad news is we do not calculate any foreseeable way for you to return to Earth. Oh, but worry not. I assure you we are a peaceful, serviceable people. Let me begin by introducing myself. My name is leader of the Valvalian tribe, the only surviving yet prosperous race of the planet Cervixia, located in the MACS06747JD galaxy. Yes, yes, I'm afraid you're quite a ways from your home planet. Your dimension-bending capacitor must have made the wrong calculations as you reached light speed. Hey, it happens to the best of us. I assure you, while it is quite different from Earth, you will find Cervixia to be quite accommodating. We Valvalians exist peacefully. We are not at war with any other planet, for our trading of rectangular manual knowledge storage units is quite valued across the galaxy. We survive on a sustenance of H2O just like you humans, except ours is green because it just looks cooler that way. And we also survive on a steady diet of Chromatica Oreos. Yes, even here in Cervixia, we bump to Rain On Me, now streaming on Spotify. And while we do partake in the usual labors of scouring the land for resources, building homes for our quickly growing populace, and expanding our intergalactic commerce with whatever neighboring planets we are able to locate via 10G network, rest assured, we do not expect you all to pay us back by forcing you into any kind of hard labor. However, your arrival is most serendipitous, and looking at your tall, brawny, handsome crew, I would say we Valvalians are truly blessed today. You see, as you may have noticed, our race is entirely female, which complicates reproduction a little bit. However, this is where we think you and your men will be of great help. Oh, 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 what, what are you? Oh, oh, I see. Uh, no, 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 that, that's okay. I, I see you rushing to unbuckle your pants, but I assure you that will not be necessary to accomplish the task at hand. Yes, indeed, we have come across other humans who have crash-landed here on Cervixia, and they have all been too eager to jump to action whenever we make the same proposition. As I stated before, we are all too familiar with the human anatomy. We understand that for your species, reproduction means that the male impales the female with the flesh needle and introduces the fluids of life for the female to receive in the sacred cavity. We Valvalians do not have any need for that kind of barbarity. We also understand that this proposition excites the human men because they hold a weird sort of fantasy in their heart. We find that most human men embark on intergalactic travel as a means to appease their urges to conquer, be it land or women. We understand most men search the furthest reaches of the galaxy looking for new land to name as theirs or for sexy alien space babes to claim. I'm sorry to say, but if you were to observe the meeting of our thighs, you would only find a cave of rugged nerve lined with shards of glass-like protrusions for defense and determined. No, I'm sorry to say, your male fantasy will not be fulfilled here. But there is still a way in which you and your men will help us reproduce. You see, human men are highly valued here in Cervixia because of the external glands that hang at the base of your flesh needle, which are fleshy sacs big enough to carry hundreds of a beautiful gestating Volvalian larva. I assure you, the process is 
mostly painless, and once inseminated artificially by an absurdly big needle, you will only feel a slight swelling and discomfort around the testicular protrusions while you are with the child. You will only require constant nutrient injections directly to your balls so that our precious larva can feed and be strong. Once our larvae are mature enough to grow on their own, they will surely find their way through your urinary tract, and you will eject our children through your meters in a process that we understand will be of great discomfort. But do not worry. We will have your Valvalian companion at your side to caress your hand and tell you it's all right. Just keep pushing. Oh, and a word of caution, I guess. Sometimes our precious larva children might find themselves lost on the way to the urethra, in which case they might swim a little too far up. Often we have had pregnancy complications in which the larva come bursting out of the belly button, essentially disemboweling their host. No, 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 don't worry. The larva are relatively unharmed whenever that happens, and we always assure their health so that your sacrifice will not be in vain. Oh, please, do not be afraid. This only happens in one out of four or five cases, I forget the number. But anyway, those who survive will have the honor of undergoing the process again and again and again until you are no longer able to hold our children. Yes, it does appear that your testicles can only handle so many births, but that's life, isn't it? Oh, oh, please, do not draw your weapons. There is no need for violence, I assure you, and I also assure you, you are far outnumbered. We Volvalians are peaceful, as I said, but we do not hesitate to turn you into ash in a millisecond with our highly sophisticated heat rays if you show any sign of aggression. Moreover, I'm afraid even if you were to rebel, it would already be too late. You see, there is something I've failed to mention so far, and I truly apologize for this oversight. While you were unconscious and while we were running the calibrating tests on your ship, we also took the liberty to inseminate your balls. We're terribly sorry, as we understand this might seem violating to you in some way, but you were just lying there and your balls looked so ripe for the taking, almost as if you were inviting us, almost as if you wanted it, almost as if you were asking for it. So yes, the deed is done and there is no turning back. Yes, yes, that's it. Lower your weapons, it's all right. Oh, but please, do not look so glum. Throughout your entire stay here in Cervixia, you will be highly provided for. We truly see you as heroes to our race. We even dedicate an entire holiday to the name of men. Rest assured, you will be provided for with everything you need. Food, water, shelter, even entertainment from time to time. We will take care of absolutely everything. All you have to do is sit there and look pretty. Oh, I do believe we have been chatting for much too long. If you will follow me, please, and comply to my commands, I will direct you to your boudoirs where you will pass most of your time. You are doing a great service to our race. We really, really appreciate it. You are really, really special. Plus, you are all such strong, strong men. I'm sure you can handle it. Good evening. Welcome to another installment of my How and What to Read series, where I discuss unusual, misunderstood, or esoteric genres of literature, along with reading methods and recommendations on its best introductory works. Now, I know you're barely tuning in and we're barely getting cozy, but already I need you to make an important choice. This is your one and only chance. After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill. The video ends. You wake up in your bed and continue to enjoy science fiction as a genre primarily dominated by men, centered on male inventions and ingenuity, and replete only with masculine concerns for sex and automation, man-made fantasies about traveling and conquering, about a man's future. Or you take the pink pill, and I'll show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. How much of science fiction was actually invented and is influenced by women. 
and together we shall deconstruct and dismantle the myths of masculinity and patriarchy and uncover just how much feminist sensibilities and aesthetics permeate the genre that you so love. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Make your choice. All right, follow me. Here we are, the corner of the world where we uncover all the truths, expose the written word, and yeah, you know what? No, we, we don't have to do that whole act for the whole video, right? <laughs> anyway, I'm sure you have a lot of questions as we journey on to uncover the truth about feminist science fiction. Let me begin by giving you some cultural context. It seems today that science fiction aesthetics and themes have suffused mainstream media more than ever before. It may be because today's technology might give us the sense that the future that authors envisioned and anticipated for so long has finally arrived, with even talks of leisurely space exploration being within hand's reach. However, more than this, it seems that these elements of science fiction that are becoming more prevalent today seem to carry an increasingly feminine sensibility to them when we look at the way fiction and entertainment implement them. In fact, one of the main inspirations for this video was just how saturated pop culture seems to be with the aesthetics nowadays. I've seen it in films like Ex Machina and Under the Skin, in TV shows like Westworld, and for some reason, I've witnessed it much, much more prominently in music. Music videos have seemingly become a medium through which primarily female musicians have begun to implement sci-fi visuals to represent their artistic personas. We saw this back in 1999 with Bjork's All Is Full of Love, for example, but even much more recently, artists like Grimes have used the same or similar sci-fi elements profusely as with her music video for her song We Appreciate Power. Janelle Monae's seven-part Metropolis conceptual album series, too, uses key ideas of human and animal Android bodies prominent in sci-fi and in reference to much much more mainstream artists just look at the album cover of Christina Aguilera's Bionic for example or even just last year look at Lady Gaga's album Chromatica of previously mentioned Oreo cookie fame the reason I keep bringing these up is because to me a feminist inspired uh, sci-fi sandwich cookie is truly one of the most bizarre ways that I've seen sci-fi aesthetics ever implemented. I've been saving these for weeks since they came out just so I could show them and they're probably really stale but if I've come this far maybe the least I can do is give you a little taste test. So I have one of them right here. Um, you can't see because of the lighting but it's pink. I tried these when I first got them and they weren't good <laughs> but maybe you have to let them age a bit like fine wine you know. Nope. Tastes like Play-Doh with sugar. Ugh, that's fucking disgusting. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I had to spit that out because we're doing keto out here on the Matrix. But anyway, just a few days ago, in fact, a friend of mine who knew I was working on this video told me to check out the new music video for Doja Cat and SZA's new song, Kiss Me More. And sure enough, those same aesthetics were fully present. This delighted me, knowing that the subject matter of this video is indeed timely and it's so pertinent to today's culture. So what is this all about? What does it all mean? Why the constant conflation of female and robot bodies? Why the allure of an alien femininity? Why the fuck are the cookies pink? Let's go ahead and unpack this mysterious thing known as feminist science fiction. Now, let's address perhaps the most pressing question. Why science fiction? Why did women choose this genre specifically to twist and turn around and transform it into a platform to voice their issues on womanhood and gender? Why couldn't they have picked something else? Well, if you're asking this question, you would have to be presuming that science fiction was a male invention that women only claimed later on. This presumption might in fact be erroneous since, as far as most scholarly and historical accounts are concerned, science fiction was actually founded by a woman. In May of 1816, famous romantic poet and utter train wreck Percy Bysshe Shelley decided to take his wife and son on a vacation of 
of sorts, traveling out to Lake Geneva to stay at the Villa Diodati and pass the time with Shelley's other poetic acquaintance, Lord Byron. You may have heard of him. He, he wrote a couple of things. After spending their time amusing themselves with foreign supernatural tales, which went perfect with the unusually gloomy weather that spring, Lord Byron made a proposition to his guest that they should each try to write their own ghost story. As Percy and Byron set to work, Percy's wife found the task initially quite difficult, unable to come up with anything. Later, however, as the unusually stormy and gloomy weather drenched the party's discussions, which eventually turned to the meanings of origins of life, to occultism and the horrors of the latest scientific developments, Mrs. Shelley, inspired by the thunder and lightning, set out to write her tale, taking into account primarily the then new scientific concept of galvanism, which involved harnessing electric currents, then an unthinkably ingenuine advancement, for a variety of purposes, and which was purported to even have the capability of reanimating corpses. Of course, most of you already know, Percy's wife was Mary Shelley, and the story she ultimately ended up writing was a quaint little tale you may have heard of, known as Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. By taking scientific developments as an inspirational basis in order to unfold a fantastic and terrifying tale, Mary Shelley left a big bold mark in the realm of speculative fiction, essentially inventing the modern blueprint for science fiction, as well as strongly influencing the genres of horror and fantasy. Here we arrive at a useful definition of what science fiction is. Fictional stories with a scientific basis, an imagined future or alternate reality based on how technological advancements could influence our ideas, inventions, and discoveries. And of course, in most of science fiction, the ultimate outcome of these ideas is not good. It is a literature of encounters, man's encounter with strange species, strange lands, strange machines that ultimately have a sense of familiarity. These things could happen in one way or another, or they might even be already happening. That is indeed the vision that Mary Shelley had in mind when she wrote of Victor Frankenstein birthing a hideous, unnatural monster using a form of science that was already all the rage during her lifetime. A science that transgressed boundaries, claimed to bring back the dead, containing potent fusions filled with dangerous possibilities. These implications have a distinct science fiction flavor to them, but what is seldom addressed when discussing Frankenstein is that at the heart of it is also a question of gender politics and feminist assertions. Because after all, what's Frankenstein about if not about a man trying to do what a woman does? Give birth to his own child. Male births figure prominently in the imagination of science fiction. For example, in the beginning skit that I showed you. You know, the one about injecting larvae in your ball sack? Yeah, that one. And Frankenstein specifically, male birth forms perhaps the basis of the most aberrant notion that Victor Frankenstein puts forward through his experiments. It was the secrets of heaven and earth that I desired to learn. And whether it was the outward substance of things or the inner spirit of nature and the mysterious soul of man that occupied me, still my inquiries were directed to the metaphysical or in its highest sense, the physical secrets of the world. In this quote, Victor is proclaiming to desire to conquer godlike knowledge over mankind and life. And yet, is he not also simply, in essence, just expressing a desire to know how women give birth? Oh, poor Frankenstein, eternally vexed by the mysteries of the vagina. Most likely, the talks that Mary Shelley witnessed between her mostly male companions around the subject of scientific advancement were laden with anxiety and uncertainty, and that is certainly the theme that her novel explores the most. Victor Frankenstein's experiments are monstrous because he dares to defy the order of nature, dares to mock God by attempting to take his place in the order of things. But what else is going on? What is understated yet prevalent in the dynamics set forward in this male birth within the actual birth of the science fiction genre? It is perhaps another source of great horror and uncertainty that Victor Frankenstein is daring to not only break down the order of nature, 
but the order of gender as well. By enacting the role of birther that 19th century England declared as the most vital duty that women were to undertake in their lifetimes. Of course, this breakdown of gender resonates greatly with our present understanding of what gender is. Our understanding that gender is not tied to just genital functions, is not tied to anatomy and chromosomes, and is hugely different from what our anatomical sex seemingly entails. This thinking beyond gender is something that would not develop as a scholarly topic until more than a century after Shelley's novel was published. Frankenstein and his creation are are perhaps a question of whether or not men are truly willing to face the consequences of their scientific advancements, which may indeed sometime in the future imply the complete dismantling of gendered existence as we know it. More on that later. Whether intentional or not, Mrs. Shelley, by birthing science fiction, not only provided a space to speculate on and imagine futuristic fatalities and monstrous technological advancements, but indeed, much more strongly, much more prominently, she envisioned a space in literature in which future authors would be able to deconstruct, question, and reimagine the concepts of gender roles, reproduction, and the social and political meanings behind our bodies. We could say due to this, and that is very much a notion I subscribe to, that feminist science fiction is not just a subset of science fiction, but in fact a series of decrees that demarcate how much of science fiction is already inherently feminist, without the need to feminize it. Beyond the foundation that Mary Shelley laid down in 1818 with Frankenstein, science fiction kept evolving as the 19th and 20th centuries dragged on, driven by primarily male authors. Authors like Jules Verne and H.G. Wells used this concept of a scientific imagination prototyped by Shelley to invent tales that transported us to the limits of man's ingenuity, to the depths of the sea, to strange and fantastic islands, and even across time. Although many of their stories still contained that same admonition towards man's hubris and the dangers of exploring the unknown that Frankenstein contained, science fiction as a body of literature from this point onward began to shed its fear of scientific advancement and evolved into an absolute titillation with the concept of exploration and space colonization. During the 20th century, science fiction gained pulp status and for the first time a self-awareness as to the existence of such a genre and an understanding of its primary consumers. Inspired mostly by the literary endeavors of Byrne and Wells, sans technological admonitions, science fiction at this point became a medium through which stories about adventurous thrills pretty much became the norm. The Space Adventures comics of the 50s and 60s pretty much cemented this image of space travel and alien adventures as a boy's playground for fantasy and joy. Fighting intergalactic baddies and exploring unknown lands, stranded in deserted planets alone with beautiful space babes. Succinctly, think Gilligan's Island in space. Space colonization emerged as a concept in essence of men's desires to conquer, own, and recreate their own societies in the furthest reaches of space, right around the time of the actual moon landing which further fueled this male euphoria over scientific milestones. Of course, today with SpaceX and Elon Musk or whatever, it would seem these fantasies are soon to become some modicum of reality. And yet, what do we truly find when we explore the philosophy and ethics behind these fantasies and desires? Behind this compulsion and titillation at the prospect of recreating western culture in some deserted land, if not a mirror experience of the same colonization that the west carried out in the Americas, in Africa, in Asia, areas of the world that were as barren in the eyes of white colonizers as the empty wasteland of Mars may seem to billionaire investors today. 
As the discipline of science fiction evolved into a mostly regurgitation of colonist doctrines, who existed to criticize and condemn such an obvious extension of the patriarchal imagination? Yes, this is indeed where feminist science fiction emerged as a fully embodied response to the oppressive prospects that have made the genre so famous to begin with. Therefore, to read science fiction is to understand that the genre of science fiction is built upon problematic notions and difficult questions that require nuance and attention from all perspectives. And as the perspectives of women and people of color became more and more marginal as sci-fi became essentially a fetishization of white colonialism, feminist science fiction aided indeed by many writers of color came roaring in in protest with a counter-imagination replete with fatalistic, scathing, and vivid critiques. Joanna Russ, one of the most celebrated authors under the moniker of feminist science fiction, was once quoted as saying, Long before I became a feminist in any explicit way, I had turned from writing love stories about women in which women were losers and adventure stories about men in which the men were the winners to writing adventure stories about a woman in which the woman won. It was one of the hardest things I ever did in my life. Russ illustrates in this quote just how difficult of an endeavor writing in this genre proved, not only surely because of all the publishing and editing obstacles that were surely planted along her way as a woman writer, but also I believe because this reimagining, this turning of the tables of the conventions within science fiction was extremely difficult to perform given how ingrained these anti-feminist notions were at the root of what science fiction had become. Russ's writing evolved from simple space adventure stories with female protagonists into full-on philosophical explorations of the nature of life, existence, and whether a life in space under the yoke of patriarchy is really worth living for anyone that is in a rich white male conqueror. Russ's quote, and indeed feminist science fiction in general, proves that it is not enough to simply include women in science fiction in order to stay true to feminist philosophies. Star Wars having a female protagonist is nice and all, but feminist science fiction aims to probe further into what the embodied existence of women and marginalized people in general is genuinely like, beyond surface level. In a 1990 interview, Russ gave this quote well after she had wholly mastered her style as a feminist writer of science fiction. My work is haunted by the banal plots that are not there. People get upset because they recognize the cues and think they're going to get a nice old adventure story. When that doesn't happen, they wonder what the hell is going on. I do this metafictional commentary a lot. Here we'll learn that to read feminist science fiction means to understand that the genre is an exercise of upturning readers' expectations. It means ultimately to take the flourishing and promising idea of travel and colonization and imbue it with haunting questions that the very concept implicates. Death, loss, wandering and hopelessness, lost in space and lost in time, and overall the question that stands out the most in fiction of this kind is, where do women fit into this fantasy? Is not the concept of space conquering only realized when we accept that women would dutifully play their sole role as childbearers, existing only to procreate and expand man's legacy of conquest? Feminist science fiction should always aim to ask the question, is there any sense in this? As celebrated black sci-fi author Samuel R. Delaney, who was also in many ways a contributor of feminist science fiction, once absurd about Russ's writing, he concluded that her stories suggest that the quality of life is the purpose of living and reproduction only a reparative process to extend that quality and not the point of life at all. Perhaps within the hubris of wanting to invade and conquer, feminist science fiction suggests we lose sight of what the true essence and purpose of life is. Women are not fulfilled by just reproducing, despite what idyllic colonization might try and have us believe. Here we see that feminist science fiction recognizes the needs of women beyond just life in a society that is inherently hostile to them and demands only their reproductive labor, even in, or perhaps especially in, fantastic stories about space travel. If we are to travel to another planet, even imaginatively, why must we insist on bringing all this baggage with us? Life is thus truly insignificant, no matter where we go, if we do not change our perspectives and convictions from within. Feminist science fiction urges us to untether ourselves from all that has made Earth a hostile environment to many 
groups of people. Certainly the prospect of exploring an alien world seems titillating to some, but what if you are already alien in some capacity here on planet Earth? What worth is there in going somewhere else where the legacy of injury and exploitation will just continue for you? These are the questions that drive the need for feminist science fiction to also contain a strong post-colonial mindset in its posturing, and why the concept of intersectionality has proven invaluable in understanding a lot of the writing done in this tradition. Octavia E. Butler, one of the most important figures not just in feminist science fiction but in science fiction in general, always brought in her writing a sense of, yes, her femininity, but of course also the struggle she faced not just as a woman, but as a black woman, and not just by repleting her stories with black female characters, although she certainly did that, but by exploring the concepts of black womanhood in the face of hostility, a changing world, and using science fiction imagination that I always wondered how power structures could be rearranged, reimagined, and dismantled. As she once said, I began writing about power because I had so little. This is why I find it imperative to state that feminist science fiction is not just fiction written by white women, and certainly not just fiction written by women either. Exploring feminist philosophies always opens the door to an imagination of thinking beyond gender and through all the barriers of gender. The perspective of men is as valuable in understanding our living existence as that of women. The perspectives of women in feminist science fiction were largely white, and yet this speaks only to the need for a more colorful approach to the embodied experiences of women of other races and their experiences with change, conquest, colonization, and racism. Feminist science fiction is not a literature that hates men. It is a literature that invites men, women, non-binary people, people who have lived presenting as male and female, people who have lived presenting as neither, etc., to question and play with concepts of our own embodiments and imagine worlds in which the fabric of oppression is undone. And if that wild, visionary, and futuristic imagination isn't what science fiction is all about, then I don't know what is. Okay, so please excuse my bluntness, but for this next section, I'm going to need you to do something for me first. It's nothing against you. It's just that I'm a little paranoid by how much you look like a camera. It's nothing too difficult. I just need you to prove to me that you're not a robot. Here, take your time. Just click all the squares that have a stoplight on them. What? Does it matter if a little corner of the stoplight bleeds over into another square? I don't know. You figure it out, Miss Big Human Brain. Okay, so you're not a robot, according to this test. But can I really be sure? Sure, maybe you can pass every single CAPTCHA test with excellence, but what if that only means that you're a very sophisticated robot? Where do we draw the line between machine and human consciousness? And is there a point in which the two meet and become inseparable? And what is consciousness anyway? Is it a strictly human action that depends on our own embodiment? Or can it be reduced to the manipulation of symbols and data? This is the same conundrum that computer scientist and philosopher Alan Turing posed in his now famous imitation game test. Dubbed the Turing test, this test presents us with the following situation. We have subjects A, B, and C. Subjects A and B are answering a series of questions posed to try to convince subject C that they are human. Subject C cannot see the responders and can only rely on the written responses coming from two screens. It is assumed that one of these subjects answering the questions is human and is trying to make subject C see the truth behind their humanity. The other subject is a machine. That means that that subject's goal is to deceive to emulate humanity via its answers and lie in a way that will make subject C think that they are the human. This Turing test thus aims to explore the question, can machines reach a point in which they can think like humans do? And if so, will technological advancements soon make human and machine indistinguishable? This is certainly a question about cyborgs, about the post-human, 
that exhilarates thousands and thousands of science fiction writers who continue to explore the subject today, and perhaps much more pressingly so today, given that the latest technological advancements perhaps reveal that machines are already reaching this point of singularity, and that humanity is growing increasingly dependent on machines and robotics even within our own bodies. However, did you know that the Turing test initially posed a separate question besides the human slash machine test? Indeed, before offering the scenario in which a human and a machine fight for recognition, Turing posed the same scenario, except initially, subject C is asked to analyze two sets of answers and figure out which subject is a man and which is a woman. This initial part of the Turing test has often been overlooked or brushed off by the various scholars who have studied Turing's writings and applied them to the fields of robotics, computer science, and philosophy. And it's been brushed off for a variety of reasons. Perhaps it has been seen as an arbitrary question posed by Turing with no real focus on the actual question of machine thinking. Or perhaps some scholars saw it as a false start on Turing's part. However, Famed literary critic Catherine N. Hales makes this precise question the centerpiece of her work on post-humanism and computer studies, titled How We Became Post-Human, Virtual Bodies in Cybernetics, Literature and Informatics, first published in 1999. Here, Hales argues that perhaps the most powerful insight into the world of cybernetics as it pertains to feminist science fiction and the imagination of future technologies is how exactly they will affect humanity and gender relations, and this insight is offered by Turing's initial question. Essentially, what Hale says is, Turing is positing that our perception of gender will be forever changed, no matter how we look at it, when the world of cyborgs is expanded and when singularity is reached. One of two things will happen. Either humanity will unite, for we will recognize humanity as entirely separate from machines and cyborgs, and thus our definition of human will be singularized, eradicating boundaries of gender and race, essentially. Or, if we fail to do so, then the cyborg itself the thinking machine will provide the necessary tools for us to shed this mortal gender coil and instead enter into a new age unified by robotics and machine cognition in which gender will no longer be distinguishable and where an insurmountable equality can be reached. Certainly, looking at this analysis, we can begin to see why primarily male-led research into Turing's insights may have indeed chosen to leave this gender question out of the discourse. Its implications were just much too powerful, much too disquieting in the field of computer research throughout the 20th century. And shit, perhaps they continue to be so given that these implications still go widely unacknowledged. But in essence, here, Hales rings the bells of caution and freedom and presents to the world a new advancement into the feminist sci-fi imagination that is unshakable and remains powerful. That to imagine future technologies must essentially always carry the implication of imagining a world where the oppressions of gender and race must always be shed. For embodied existence is something fragile that can and will be easily eradicated by technology. This certainly makes many scholars uneasy, especially if they have their reservations on the questions of gender. But was Alan Turing really intent on presenting this polarizing question of a new world rid of gender trappings to the world? Well, of course, we cannot say for sure, but let me tell you about other aspects of Alan Turing's life that you may well be unaware of. Alan Turing was a gay man, and in 1952 he was convicted for indecency for sleeping with another man, homosexuality being, of course, a criminal act in 1950s England. He was sentenced to receive hormonal therapy in order to decrease his libido, essentially chemical castration. Two years later, in 1954, Turing was found dead in his apartment. The death was ruled suicide by cyanide poisoning, and yet many of Turing's family members and loved ones expressed the discrepancy in this ruling, given that Turing had never expressed any suicidal thoughts and had even received his sentencing to hormonal therapy in good spirits in a joking manner. Many theorized that his death was perpetrated by the government, given that his ideas on futuristic advancements were often perceived by fellow scholars and government officials as dangerous, as communist propaganda, and of course, his revealed homosexuality was ill-received as well. Whatever the reality behind his death may have been, for now there really is no way of knowing, one thing is for sure. 
Alan Turing possessed a dangerous imagination and vision, and also suffered the consequences of living his own embodied reality in a world that simply could not accept him for who he was. A world that disdained him for his own biology and natural existence. Could this torturous existence have led him to demarcate the conclusions of a world where gender and sexuality would become irrelevant? You decide. His insights into machine cognition and robotics changed our perceptions of embodied reality forever. And in particular, science fiction is now in many ways married to this idea of thinking beyond gender, beyond barriers, and beyond our problematic politics around our embodiment, thanks to him. This philosophy is indispensable in understanding what feminist science fiction aims to address in regard to scientific advancement. In our world today, cyborgs, robots, and androids, as I said before, seem to be an imminent reality rather than a wild concept bred from an overactive imagination, as earlier works of science fiction tended to introduce them. Feminism and its relationship to cyborgs appears to have a much stronger connection of kinship than what was previously imagined in earlier decades of computer studies and insights into cybernetics. For instance, the cyborg today is a ubiquitous addition to our everyday interactions, where we talk to phones and trust machinery to do a vast majority of our labor. And yet, if we look just at the surface level, we can see that there always seems to be a strange fixation with femininity when it comes to these artificial intelligences. It starts at the concept of servitude. For instance, why are Siri and Alexa female voices by default? Do we maybe feel a little bit more comfortable giving commands to a female voice? And when it comes to already existing AI, why is it often given a female identity as well? Just look at the robot Sophia and the Twitter chatterbot Tay. These are male creations of artificial femininity. It appears that the female body and the robot body are equally fetishized. Hey, did you know that some of the latest advancements in robotics today have to do with robots that can have sex with men? Did you know that in 2017, at an electronics show in Austria, one of these so-called sex robots, after displaying its features of being able to reciprocate romance and sexual advancements, was absolutely demolished by a group of men who essentially used this robot to the point of destruction? Interesting. Anyway, Westworld is a really crazy outlandish show, isn't it? The world of robotics and cybernetics today poses many, many more struggles for femininity than was previously known possible, and it is something that feminist science fiction still continues to wrestle with. In 1985, Donna Haraway published her Cyborg Manifesto, in which she detailed her critiques of feminism's focus on identity politics, and instead looked to the figure of the cyborg as a destabilizer of this rigidity, and as a figure in science fiction and reality, in which issues of womanhood and race could shelter and do away with their trappings. In various passages, Haraway describes this embodiment of the cyborg as being born from the very same patriarchal notions that have oppressed and entrapped femininity. The main trouble with cyborgs, of course, is that they are the illegitimate offspring of militarism and patriarchal capitalism, not to mention state socialism. But illegitimate offspring are often exceedingly unfaithful to their origins. Their fathers, after all, are inessential. Haraway, in this Marxist reading, recognizes the origins of cyborgs as being strictly materialist. They are a capitalist and military nightmare originally created for the sole purpose of exciting that morbid imagination that dreams of automated war and labor. Haraway's last remark on this quote is in the spirit of rebellion, of recognizing that a cyborg, if indeed one day will be allowed to think and act for itself, need not necessarily abide to the wishes of its creators. And so too our imagination of technology, our treatment of science fiction need not fall in line with this patriarchal dream of industrial conquered body. Haraway further writes, The cyborg does not dream of community on the model of the organic family, this time without the Oedipal project. The cyborg would not recognize the Garden of Eden, it is not made of mud and cannot dream of returning to dust. Thus, the imagination of feminist science fiction sees itself obliged to think of technological advancements and posthumanism not as a culmination of patriarchal society, but rather as a clean slate, an undoing of tradition and culture upon which a new identity will be born. I chose to conclude this discussion of feminist science fiction and its philosophies and propositions on the image of the cyborg because one, 
As I stated before, it is a pressing issue of technological advancements that is becoming increasingly a reality, and two, because it is perhaps the culmination of ideas in regards to feminism and identity politics. If we look to the cyborg, we see Joanna Russ's fiction, we see Hales and Haraway's philosophizing, culminating in an image of a post-gender world, a technology flipped on its head ripped from its capitalist beginnings and used as a symbol. We see that science fiction and technological advancements are here dreamed up not as a patriarchal nightmare, but as a nightmare for patriarchy, an opportunity for women and gender non-conforming people and people of color to reinvent civilization, to reinvent identity, to highlight the problems with gendered existence and show how the imagination of technology is ultimately synonymous with the imagination of liberation. And finally, we have arrived at the most exciting part for my bookish viewers, in which I recommend some titles that I think are essential reading when it comes to exploring the genre at hand. For feminist science fiction, I have chosen five recommendations of a varied kind, written by female writers, male writers, writers of color, all exploring different ideas of technology, space travel, and weird encounters. These titles are presented by the order in which they were first published and should provide a pretty concise detailing of what feminist science fiction has to offer. First, I am recommending a novel by a male author, but as I've stated before, this hardly matters, for feminist science fiction is written by people of all identities and brings in various perspectives centered around a variety of philosophies and decrees. This novel was written by Samuel R. Delaney, whom I have spoken of before as the author of Hog, a book I simply cannot read because of various reasons. Check out my Books I Cannot Read video to hear more on that. But please don't let that fool you. Mr. Delaney's work outside of that is not only very much readable, but his science fiction work in particular is utterly mesmerizing and his writing style quite beautiful. Samuel R. Delaney is an openly gay black author who historically always campaigned for the inclusion of strong, well-rounded female and LGBT characters in science fiction, and we see his efforts fully realized in his novel, Babel 17, first published in 1966. In this novel, Delaney explores the concept of language, and in a futuristic setting where planet Earth is at war with intergalactic invaders, Language in particular is turned to as a possible tool that can be weaponized. Babel 17 refers to a string of linguistic sequences that form a language that can have adverse and perhaps fatal effects on whoever listens to it. The military government then recruits the help of a highly intelligent and verbose poet and linguist, Ridra Wong, to try to decode the mysteries behind said language for the benefit of her government's use. First, what we have here is a novel that is led by a female protagonist who is not a sexual object, is not pretty decor, and who is smart, capable, and leads the majority of the action that the novel unfolds. Delaney, as I said, was highly interested in representing characters who were strong, likable, and unique, and was not afraid to grant these roles to female and LGBT characters, which was highly unheard of at the time this was published. Beyond this, Delaney's novel is a seminal work in feminist science fiction, in my opinion, because of the contrast and questions it poses in regards to traditions of language and futuristic technologies, and wonders where women and LGBT people fall in line with technological advancements of this kind. As I said, Ridra Wong is a poet and linguist, both humanities-based professions, and historically the humanities have largely been seen as a feminine discipline, contrasting with the more rugged and masculine sciences. Delaney blurs the distinction between the two disciplines and asks questions about the power of language, about the power that words can hold over people, which is of course a highly relevant topic in the fields of feminist and queer studies. And he does so while still portraying an admirable feminine power and non-heterosexual relationships. Delaney is a true visionary and tour de force in the field of feminist science fiction, and his writing strongly influenced future writers of the genre, so I believe his work to be essential, and to me it still very much holds up. Speaking of writers who were highly influenced by Delaney, up next I'm going to talk about one of them perhaps the most well-known author of feminist science fiction and one of the most well-known names in science fiction in general. 
an author who carved out her own unique narrative voice while exploring issues of gender, sexuality, and imaginary universes. I'm talking about Ursula K. Le Guin, and in particular, I am recommending perhaps her most famous novel, The Left Hand of Darkness, first published in 1969. During her first decades as an author, Le Guin was known as an ardent activist, identifying with issues of anti-violence and gender studies within feminism, and participating in various protests against the Vietnam War and nuclear weapons. In The Left Hand of Darkness, Le Guin cements what to her was the ideal and most useful purpose of science fiction, to act as a thought experiment about imaginative circumstances, not to escape to a fictitious world, but to comment on the circumstances of our own existence in this very real world. The novel takes place in an entirely fictitious alternate universe and centers around a rigidly male character named I, who travels as an ambassador to the nearby planet of Gethin on a mission to try to convince the planet's officials to join a coalition along with I's home planet. Initially a seemingly straightforward mission, I soon finds himself in an intergalactic state of culture shock as he struggles greatly to understand the population of Gethin and their customs, where humans develop much differently and their cultural and social constraints and behaviors around gender are different from what I is used to. Indeed, it seems that gender may be almost non-existent in the sense that I has been raised to define it in the planet of Gethin. Thus, in this novel, Le Guin seeks to explore the origins of gender and racial difference, brings into question what the essence of humanity would truly be like if we were to shed these socially constructed identities, and how a character like I, so used to his own rigid sense of masculinity, can grow to accept and assimilate into a culture that is so seemingly an affront to his convictions about how people should behave according to their sex. In this novel, Le Guin also explores a pseudo-homosexual relationship between I and a character that he initially mistrusts due to his feminine mannerisms, which are unbecoming to his seemingly male exterior. Although some critics point out certain flaws around the depictions of masculinity and homosexuality in the novel that Le Guin herself apologized for in later years, nonetheless this novel, to me, is exemplary for two reasons. One is the understanding that our definitions and studies of gender and sexuality are ever evolving. And indeed, since many of these works were written in earlier decades, a lot of their language and observations may indeed be outdated. But two, nonetheless, to me this novel represents an amazing leap in imagination, a presentation of culture and embodiment that is so relevant and powerful despite being set in fantastic and imaginary lands. If you are set on exploring feminist science fiction, it is my belief that you must read Le Guin's work. Throughout this discussion, we talked all about cyborg bodies and about the eradication of conventional thinking around embodiment and the implication that this has for our understanding of gender and gender performance. This next work is, in my opinion, one of the most potent and pertinent literary works dealing with these subjects. It is The Girl Who Was Plugged In, first published in 1973 and authored by James Tiptree Jr., the pen name adopted by feminist author Alice Sheldon. In this novella, Sheldon covers the subject of a materialist existence rampant capitalism and its conflation with feminized robot bodies. The story follows P. Burke, a 17-year-old girl who is disfigured as a result of a hormonal disorder. She is enlisted to use her consciousness to power up the brainless advertising model Delphi. Essentially, this is a society in which advertising as we know it has been outlawed, yet advertising is still carried out by corporations who create celebrities who serve as models for their products. These models are artificially bred brainless bodies that are then controlled by a selected consciousness. So essentially our main character P. Burke is plugged into the body of Delphi so that she can carry out her commanding corporation's advertising campaigns. Not only is this a scathing critique on consumerism and an outstanding visionary work, I mean, doesn't that sound exactly like what present day Instagram models and influencers do? But beyond that, Sheldon here is exploring the subject of an embodied reality and the performance of gender. The novella centers around Burke enacting femininity through the brainless body of Delphi, being unable to fully perform her own womanhood in her own body, given that her own disfigured body has limited her possibilities and led society to ostracize her. Given Sheldon's own real-life need to use a 
male pseudonym in order to achieve the ability to enact her role as a writer. We can see how this exploration of embodiment might also work as an autobiographical account of a woman's struggle to enact different roles that are disallowed in a patriarchal society. On top of this, the novella explores the tension between reality and simulation and distends gender play as a completely separate entity from our true selves. Certainly subject matter that is invaluable and salient when it comes to discussions of trans identities and the real meaning behind gender. Truly a visionary, zany, and wonderfully written work that is often overlooked, yet in my mind it exists as an essential sci-fi classic. Joanna Russ is a name I mentioned heavily throughout this discussion, for her works are truly fundamental within the cementing of feminist science fiction as a movement. I recommended another of her works in a previous video, uh, that being We Who Are About To, so you can go and see my thoughts on that in part 4 of my Disturbing Book series. But for this video, an introductory discussion of the philosophy and ideology behind her work is best done by her seminal novel, The Female Man, first published in 1975. Here, Russ presents us with four different women who live in four different alternate universes and each lives a different embodied existence within femininity and their relationships to men. The entirety of the novel involves the four women traveling across dimensions and visiting each other's worlds, where they discover just how different experiences of womanhood can be depending on the social and environmental circumstances. In one of the alternate realities, the inferiority of women is widely accepted across societies. In another alternate universe, men never existed in the world, so the growth of women as independent and powerful is never stunted. And in another alternate world still, men and women represent two warring tribes who are in constant battle with each other. Russ always approaches her subject matter with incredible wit and electrifying prose, and always, always, tongue-in-cheek and with an unfailing sense of humor over the absurdities presented in the book. She is certainly capable of drawing out the humor of seeing women's realities through the veneer of fantasy and imaginary futures. The female man displays the true potential when it comes to the imagination of encounters, of alternate dimensions, of twisting societal norms, of creating imaginary matriarchies, of dystopian and utopian futures, and her unique voice within the pantheon of science fiction has proven powerful and life-changing even today. So if you want to see the true potential that feminism has with invigorating sci-fi imagination, look no further than this novel. And finally, echoing back to feminist science fiction's need to explore the influence of power structures and a post-colonial mindset in its philosophy, I turn back to Octavia E. Butler, one of the greatest black women authors who ever wrote about power in a futuristic and intergalactic sense. I would say that all of her works are fantastic and worthy of your attention, and I have previously named her novel Kindred as one of my all-time favorites. I was torn between two works to recommend by her for this video. Uh, one was the short story Blood Child, which is a pregnant man story, which we have covered before. <laughs> of course, while still recommending you read that short story, nonetheless I decided that the time allotted to her writing in this video shall be spent talking about perhaps her most important exploration of futurism, racial relations and power structures, and societal change. Her novel Dawn, first published in 1987. This is the first installment of a trilogy known as the Xenogenesis or Lilith's Brood trilogy. Yet I think it can also be read as a single novel that stands more than well on its own. The novel introduces us to Lilith, a black woman who was awakened by aliens 250 years after planet Earth was completely destroyed by nuclear warfare. The alien race known as the Onkali assure her that they do not mean any harm and instead want to help humanity reconstruct their civilization and continue to reproduce. However, slowly they reveal that this comes at a price and a mutual sacrifice for both races. The Onkali will sacrifice their resources in order to protect and raise humanity, but humans must sacrifice their very identity as humans for the Onkali plan to crossbreed with humans and the new generation of humanity will inevitably contain both human and Onkali traits. Butler's prose flows with disquieting detail and intrigue. The questions she poses about gender and race are powerful and mind-bending and the world she builds is so unique, so horrific and ultimately full of spiritual questions. This to me is the ultimate culmination of feminist science fiction. 
a work that so masterfully handles sociopolitical commentary and metaphysics, all beautifully wrapped in an incredibly inventive science fiction story written by one of the most important voices in contemporary American writing. If you're only inclined to read one book out of the five I have recommended, I would strongly, strongly suggest that you let it be this. And there you go. Those are all of my introductory remarks on the genre of feminist science fiction, along with my reading recommendations. It's been a long, arduous journey across galaxies, across time, across dimensions, and perhaps this is the arduous labor that it takes to utterly understand existence itself. And isn't that really the point of science fiction? If you stuck all the way through, thank you so much for watching. As always, I hope I made sense, and I hope you learned something. By the way, that pink pill you took earlier, it was just a Pepto-Bismol tablet. You didn't need any pill. You're human. You've lived as a human. All of this knowledge was in you all along. Science fiction, no matter how outlandish or out there, inevitably always comes from human experience. And I hope if you've learned anything, I hope that it is at least that the most imaginative tales are often the ones most pertinent to our real lives. Now, go on. Continue reading, continue learning, and continue to explore this tiny, tiny corner of our universe we call life. And always remember, the sky was never the limit. I don't know what that means. I'm just trying to sound deep. Okay, bye.